Oh my god! What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Daily Space Weather. I'm your host, Dan, a.k.a. Smash a Mash. Thanks for tuning in. Today we'll be talking about solar polar field reversal, coronal mass ejection sighted, and cosmic rays. We saw a coronal mass ejection come out of the southwestern limb of the closest star. That one right there. And that is not Earth facing. That is going to miss the Earth to the west. We also saw one on the far side of the sun. We'll show you momentarily. First, here is a composite image. We see zero sunspots, although one could be forming. We saw the possibility of one as we started doing show prep today. So let's talk about Lagrangian points. Lagrangian points are gravitational equilibrium points. And at those equilibrium points, we are able to put a smaller body. So in this case, you've got these two large bodies, AKA the sun and the earth. And if you put a spacecraft in this location or this location or this location or this location or at L3 on the opposite side of the sun where people think Nibiru is located, that object will basically stay in that location with very little use of thrusters and engines and so on to stay at the location. And so we've got objects in these spots. The SOHO is located here. Stereo A is here. Stereo B is out here at L4, and there are, there are uh, spacecraft at L2 as well orbiting that location. So looking at Lagrange point 5, where Stereo A is located, here's what we see. A far side coronal mass ejection there. We see this start to emerge from the corona at about... Eight PM Universal Time. So a non-Earth facing coronal mass ejection there, folks, Earth would be out in this direction from the perspective of stereo A, again located at Lagrangian point five. Let's take a look at some Helio Viewer movies here to show you zero sunspots. Although there may be one that's just formed right here. So that area of magnetic organization there could be a sunspot. We'll let you know by the end of the video if it is at the moment we streamed it live. And we just prefer the live format for various reasons, timeliness being one of them. So you may ask yourself, what evil lurks in the depths of a coronal hole? This one's shaped like a TIE fighter. Check it out. It's a TIE fighter. It must be an Imperial Coronal Hole, folks. And if you're wondering, I actually hate Star Wars. But in any case, we're seeing a solar polar field reversal happening right here. That equatorial coronal hole there is north solar polar field oriented. So this one down here, the one we're currently receiving a solar wind from, we saw a brief geomagnetic storm conditions yesterday. That's South Pole. This one is North Pole oriented. So we see the solar polar field reversal happening. And we'll tell you more about that later in the video. We've been seeing some rowdy activity. This is setting sunspot 2804. And we'll save the rest of the rowdy activity for toward the end of the video, as there's lots of data to blast through. So we can let you know if the local yellow dwarf is about to blast you. All right, so next, a diagram of the solar system. There's where stuff is right now. And there's where things will be in a week. It's a waning crescent moon by the 9th of March. As Mercury starts, as Venus rather, starts to swing around the far side of the sun. Here's a star chart. I like to use in-the-sky.org. 
I face mine to the south. I'm currently facing to the south. And here is the ecliptic. That's this yellow line. If you're up before dawn and you have clear skies, you may see the moon, which was shining brightly through the south-facing kitchen window. The 10.7 centimeter radio flux has dropped all the way down to 71. So back to solar minimum conditions suddenly, having risen back up to, uh, I believe it was actually at 83 there for a moment. And there is the 10.7 centimeter radio flux, a proxy for sunspot number, not really a proxy, but a proportional measurement of solar output. The radio flux is directly proportional to the sunspot number. That's this black line. Sunspot number is this red line. And let's continue on. We do see some geomagnetic unrest and a brief period of geomagnetic storm forecasted here by NOAA. So right there you can see NOAA forecasting for a, another small geomagnetic storm there, a KP of 5 forecasted for actually while we're making this video. So that one didn't really arrive. We're seeing a double pulse from the coronal hole wind stream that's currently striking. And thanks everybody for leaving comments yesterday. Some interesting comments as our viewers learn stuff they may have not previously known about, uh, for example, why, Mar why March is the most geomagnetically affected month. So perhaps check yesterday's video and the comments. Next, looking at volcanoes, as we don't only watch solar eruptions, we watch earthly eruptions as well. And what's on the list is Mount Abiko. It's producing a 7,000 foot ash plume of, over Paramushir Island, Suinosejima, Suinosejima rather, exploded and it produced a volcanic ash cloud of unknown size, Cinnabung. Check it out, some major uptick there at Cinnabung. It's produced a 40,000 foot ash plume as it's exploded. And that has been the deadliest volcano we've seen on Earth. Uh, volcanoes have been only responsible for a few deaths on planet Earth that we know of in the past couple of years. Cinnabung actually generated a tsunami a couple of years ago. It's produced a 40,000 foot ash plume. Please don't pole vault that caldera. It may be outside of your abilities. Pupil cut the pedal, sporadic emissions there as it mildly explodes. I don't know what's mild about a volcanic explosion, but that's what it says. Fuego mildly exploding as well. That's in Guatemala. Sangay in Ecuador. Volcanic ash not observed. Please don't build a campsite on the lower slopes of Sangay in Ecuador. It could erupt and encase you in a thermoplastic flow. Thermoplastic flow, which is not the way to go. There are better ways to meet your doom than to be stuck in a thermoplastic flow. Also, Sabancaya, intermittent emissions from it in Peru are a reminder that you should not attempt a back handspring over that caldera. Next, earthquakes. We show it daily on the Daily Space Weather videos. And it's pretty calm here. No major quakes over the past 24. The largest one came in just a few hours ago at Taiwan. And I'm just going to let the list scroll up here. Small deep quake in southern Alaska. So pretty calm here when it comes to the realm of earthquakes. There was a 4.9 at Iceland, a 5.1 at Columbia, a 4.9 in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, a 4.7 at Iceland as well. So pretty chill when it comes to the realm of earthquakes Vanuatu saw a deep quake at about 170 kilometers depth and a 4.8 magnitude. And yeah, the largest of the past 24 came in about five hours ago here. 423 universal time at Taiwan. By the way, this Smash O stream was streamed live to Twitch. It's twitch.tv slash Smash a great mobile streaming plat a great live streaming platform. They've got a mobile app you may want to check out as well. BitChute is another spot where we have content, some of it exclusive, although we do have the most exclusive content at YouTube. Moving on, let's do a cosmology segment. And this one should be somewhat feature rich. Let's talk about cosmology, shall we? 
first of all, our mission. So we've started a science foundation, which is why we purchased the website smashamash.org, which will redirect you to the website smashamash.com. If you head to smashamash.com slash forum slash mission, you'll see our mission. And number one is to assist study and, and report on the ongoing formation of a unified theory of physics. Also to raise the awareness of the general public of the relationship between space, weather, and Earth effects. Your weather largely comes from space. To connect and consult with media organizations and multiply our reach, hence videos like this one. To demonstrate cutting-edge proof-of-concept solutions to problems. To publish scientific papers in a multidisciplinary manner, including but not limited to sciences like spectroscopy and the rest listed here, astrophysics and cosmology also on the list, to assist mankind by advancing the study of predictive phenomenon, to do things like optimize value, reduce risk and liability, save lives and resources, and adapt no matter what the adversity is, and to not be ossified in our beliefs, and to treat those who are with love, respect, and inclusion to the scientific discussion. Sometimes it takes a long time for folks to catch up with the new science. So that's part of what we're doing here. We're a news distillation service. We're also doing cosmology, astrophysics, geophysics, and so on. As I've been believing for a long time, since the mid-90s, that astrophysics and cosmology are in the process of being rewritten. Really, all the physical sciences are in the process of being rewritten. So help us out. Support us by clicking on our links. Visit smashamash.com, smashamash.org, become a patron, etc. Maybe check out our forum. We've just updated it yesterday with a forum post in the The Sun forum about Grand Solar Minimum. So we've just put up a couple of posts here with a chart and a link to an article about solar activity over the past thousand years from proxy data. Proxy data from carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratios in wood, which tells us cosmic ray flux, which likely, likely tells us solar agenda. Not solar agenda. <laughs> the sun doesn't have an agenda, does it? Anyway, perhaps check out the forum. And you can find links to all of that at smashamash.com. Let's talk about the structure of the galaxy. Now, you may think that there would be jets coming out of the galactic core in this sort of a fashion, perpendicular to the galactic plane. But that's not the case at all, as Sagittarius A star's poles appear to not be aligned in that fashion at all. They're greatly offset. So rather than like this, Sagittarius A star must be on some kind of a acute angle, more like this. And so this article here, this is a phys.org article from which we took this image here. And this is showing you all kinds of things like the Large Magellanic Cloud. And there you can see Cygnus. And over here is the Vela Pulsar. But this article is about the North Polar Spur. So there is some argument about how far away the North, Solar, the North Polar Spur is. And the North Polar Spur is well, it's a giant jet of plasma emanating from sort of near the inner portion of the galaxy, but it's, there's argument as to what it even is. It could be a supernova remnant in the, in the foreground. Perhaps check out this article if you like. It's on phys.org in the Astronomy and Space section. And it is one of the largest structures in the Milky Way. It can be seen in radio and X-ray wavelengths. So perhaps have a read on that. And if you want to learn more about the structure of the local area, head to plasmascape.com. So at plasmascape.com, you can find yourself with a link, plasmascape.com slash plasmascape underscore 007. If you click that link, you will find yourself on this screen. Let me give you a quick tour of what this is. You're looking at the solar system here, this purple ring. This is uh, Pluto's orbit. Here's Neptune's orbit, Uranus's orbit. And if you press the A button, the A button will bring out all kinds of little tabs here. And what those tabs are, are different, obviously, 
directional vectors here. So this one's pointing, pointing at the North Galactic Pole. And right now you're on zoom level one. You're not on zoom level one. You're starting out on zoom level, I think it's zoom level two you start out. There you go. So there's zoom level two. And you can move this all around. This is a three-dimensional visualization tool. And so what you were looking at is actually toward the galactic core there. And there you can see the North Galactic Pole. And that spur would be up in this area somewhere, up around here. But in any case, what this is showing you is some important information. So first of all, you see this right here, the solar apex. That is where the sun is moving in relation to the local chimney. So if you zoom out to level five, you will see this hourglass shaped feature. If you zoom way out, this hourglass shaped feature, this is a feature of dust and gas in which the local stars are located. The local interstellar environment looks about like that. And allow me to get off screen while I continue here. And this entire structure is moving towards Cygnus. So Cygnus is this bright spot you can see right here on the galactic plane. That's Cygnus. And this entire structure is moving in that direction. Within this structure, and we know this by looking at the real motion of stars, which we can calculate uh, by mainly by parallax because these are all fairly close stars. So again, this structure is moving roughly like that. However, the sun is moving like this in relation to other stars within this structure. So that's just a little bit of a tour there. Again, the solar apex, that's the direction the sun's moving within the local chimney. And the local chimney is moving toward Cygnus, toward the star Deneb coincidentally. And that's uh, right by this bright spot here under my pointer. And you can find all this at plasmascape.com. And these are the different zoom levels. So if you press one, it'll zoom into the inner solar system. Here's Mars's orbit. Number two will bring you out to just outside Pluto's orbit. Three will show you the heliosphere. So this will zoom it out. Now the heliosphere is probably not shaped like that, like a sphere, but it's just a visualization tool for astrography, meaning the location of where objects are. And here's sort of another in between the local chimney and the rest of the interstellar environment. And then at number five, you can actually see the local chimney, sort of the, the local interstellar structure So check that out, perhaps, plasmascape.com. Next, we're going to pick a random object here and check it out on the Neil Gorel Swift Bat X-ray Observatory. This one is the second, uh, close to the end of the list there. It's number 1002. So this object coincides with something. We've picked a quantum random number here between 1 and 1031. 1002, what might it be? Well, turns out that it's Quasar 4C, 4C-03.79, a quasar. And quasars are very important, folks. They are galaxies where you're looking directly down the poloidal field of the galaxy. So these tend to be very bright. And in the mid-90s, we didn't even know what these were or how they could be so bright. Now it's known that it all comes down to perspective. And we appreciate when our viewers have perspective and have some clue about the structure of things like galaxies and the Milky Way galaxy, for example, and also the interior workings of the sun, perhaps. So in any case, here is the transient X-ray map. These are the X-ray outputs. There's the historic graph going back about 16 years. 
Here's a 30-day graph. And it looks like it may have shut down here in X-ray. This is the two-day chart up here in the upper left. And let's take a look at this with the Simbad visual tool. And you can see that bright orb there. Typically what quasars look like. No real surprise there. Quasars typically appear to be spheres. What's interesting about a quasar, folks, is if you weren't looking directly down the poloidal field of this thing, it may look like this, like a spiral galaxy. But because you're looking directly down the pole, you're getting this extremely bright imagery. Instead, there is a poloidal field associated with that region of all galaxies, it, it appears. And this, also, this all has to do with the magnetic orientation of the galactic core. So in any case, here it is on the two mass, which is infrared light. And let's take a look at it on Chandra. It should show up in X-ray. And there you can see it on the Chandra X-ray telescope. Great view of that quasar. Quasar 4C 3.79. And you can find all these things yourself at the Neil Gorel Swift Bat X-ray Observatory. It's a transient monitor that monitors X-ray flux from these objects. And that's today's cosmology segment. Let's move on to some more stuff. All right, next thing we're going to look at is solar flares. And we don't really see any significant ones. A couple B-class crackles here on the GO-16 X-ray flux graph there. There's a three-day chart of it. And not surprising there, as we don't see any at least large sunspot groups, although there could be one growing as we stream the video live. We don't see any proton strikes. No surprise there. No coronal mass ejections were forecasted or expected to really strike Earth anytime soon. Next, the real-time solar wind. And we just saw an uptick here. This is the second pulse of the coronal hole wind stream. So we're seeing a second pulse. And you can see this characteristic uptick in the solar wind density, and then a downtick in the density, and an uptick in the solar wind velocity. That's typically what we always see from coronal hole wind stream. So this is a second pulse here. Solar wind density made it up to 22 or so protons per cubic centimeter. And we're off the highs here. The highs reach just under, just about 580 kilometers per second. Current conditions. And we just saw an uptick as we made the video, too. So here's a little uptick in the density once again. Will this drop back off? And will the velocity increase? I have no forecast for that. I don't think anybody really has any means to forecast solar wind speed. Let's move on. The KP index, a measurement of global geomagnetism at three. And again, NOAA is forecasting a minor geomagnetic storm, expecting it to get up here to a KP of five sometime today. I neither agree nor disagree. Next, we'll look at some visualizations of the magnetosphere. Here's the velocity. And keep in mind, this is uh, the this is going to show you velocity from negative 600 to 600 kilometers per second. No real surprises there. Here's the density. And the density shown here is between 0 and 4 protons per cubic centimeter. You can see that dense portion of plasma around the Earth, especially on the equatorial plane view there on your left. And you should see that drop down here at the end as the density goes down and the velocity goes up right at the end. And it's not there. I stand corrected. Next, the pressure. And for some reason, that's not loaded. Just give it a moment, folks. We are streaming live. Are you going to make a liar out of me, Geospace Magnetosphere movie? How dare you? 
How dare you, Geospace Magnetosphere movie. Give me a moment. I'm going to press refresh and see if it works. There we go. And you're looking at magnetohydrodynamic pressure here in nanopascals. Each one of these slides was four hours of data courtesy University of Michigan. If you want to read how it's derived, the models are derived from what's called the Space Weather Modeling Framework. You can read about that by clicking the Details tab. It's a lot of data. Next, looking at ground magnetic perturbations. Since we're currently living a geomagnetic excursion, we show this daily. And I would note the similarity between the North and South Polar regions here. What do you think about the possibility that the South geomagnetic pole has split as well as we've seen major perturbations south of South America as well as in the Indian Ocean south of Australia, but not today. So here's a different view here of the same data, the global map, and we would expect to see this a little bit more perturbed. You're looking at geospace delta B here. This is changes in the B field in nano Tesla. A little bit chaotic in the magnetic environment right now. You see pulses all around the oceans and so on. I'll let it play through a second time. And like the other geospace magnetosphere movies, this is four hours of data. And since it's not visible in the archive, we at least show four hours daily on the daily space weather videos. Next, looking at the auroral forecast here. And we would expect this to increase a little bit, especially if we see a KP of 5 achieved, a mild G1 geomagnetic storm. These are where likely's, likely aurora would be visible. Borealis on the left, Australis on the right. Next, some magnetic data. And we'll talk about solar polar field reversals here. And here's the GOES magnetometer. The Earth is in a North Pole current sheet now. And that is affecting the way the coronal hole wind stream sort of strikes the magnetosphere, I'll say. That's three days of data there. And you can see some big sawtooth variations here in this. And that's typical when there is a lot of plasma in between the sun and the earth. And there indeed is a lot of plasma between the sun and the earth right now. You can see some of it right in here. Those bunched up potential field surface source lines are an indication that there is a bunch of plasma there. Here's the last image. You can see the Earth is solidly in the North Pole current sheet there. Keep in mind the data is 1 hour and 34 minutes old from when we streamed live. Here's a line of sight field plot. And we'll talk about solar polar field reversals on the, on the next slide. This one shows you the solar magnetogram and the polar fields. The solar poloidal fields. There's the north. There's the south. And so here's the coronal hole field plot, and you can see how far south this north solar polar field has stretched, and the south solar polar field stretching up to the equator as well. That is the solar polar field reversal being viewed in real time, essentially. And this is a normal thing throughout the solar cycles. It is what occurs throughout the middle of a solar cycle. By the end, these colors will be reversed. And this will be red, and this will be green. And here's a still image of the coronal magnetic field plot. And you can see right here, you see this black potential field surface source line. That is a north solar polar field line all the way down by the equator. That is the solar polar field reversal happening before your very eyes, something that we find quite interesting here, a super important aspect 
of solar cycles, which, by the way, we are working on explaining. Don't be surprised to see a paper come out about that. Next, we're looking at a diagram of the atmosphere here. So this is penetration of electromagnetic magnetic radiation through atmospheric layers, thermosphere, mesosphere, stratosphere, troposphere, where you live and where all your weather occurs, the troposphere, as well as temperatures on the left, densities on the right. And these letters over here, this is the D layer, the E layer, and the F layer of the ionosphere, which happens to be where the GO-16 makes its measurements. Here's another diagram of the Van Allen belts. This shows you distances in miles to things like geosynchronous GPS satellites and the low Earth orbit of the International Space Station and so on. We're moving on to charging hazards. This is the electron flux section of the video. And you can see some charging hazards here, minor ones north of the equator there in the South Pacific and a bit over Mexico. We saw the electron flux crater as we typically do during corona hole wind streams. No surprises there to our regular viewers, but it was a surprise to NOAA. So here's the one year chart to put that in context, but here is the forecast model for the greater than or equal to two mega electron volt electron flux. And you can see how high of a forecast they came up with here and the observation way down here. So that, uh, that observation there, that's the yellow diamond, was forecasted way up here. Not surprising considering we saw a second coronal hole wind stream pulse. So that is what you would expect from a second coronal hole wind stream pulse. Enough said about that. Here's a visualization of electron density for the entire air column all the way up to the thermosphere where your GPS satellite might be located. And we see some anomalies here happening which we typically do at low levels of electron flux. So you see some anomalies here at nighttime. I'll let it play through a second time. You typically only see high densities around the equator at noon. And we're not seeing that. We're seeing nighttime blobs of high density electron regions, mainly over the equator, but you usually don't see that at nighttime. Here's one slice of the atmosphere, and you're looking at megahertz here. These are the vibrations of the plasma in the ionosphere layer. Just one slice of the atmosphere, and this is about where the GO-16 does make its measurements. We see some charge-ups there over the South Pacific, but nothing too anomalous going on here. Looking pretty normal there. Oh, some sudden charge-ups there, once again, over places like India and the Indian Ocean. Here's the latest image, which is from 1030 Universal Time, and those charge-ups have already subsided by now. 1030 UT, which is also Greenwich Mean Time, by the way, folks, if you're wondering what Universal Time is. And now we're moving into the realm of meteorology to increase the probability that you don't vanish. under a pile of weather. So here are the jet streams. We're looking at the 250 hectopascal winds at nullschool.net. And check out the extreme chaotic jet stream flow over the Western Hemisphere. You got a jet stream split up and doubled up here over the Western US, converging on a very powerful jet stream there just off the coast of places like New Jersey. You've got a portion of the jet stream blowing backwards here, east to west over portions of the North Atlantic. It is a chaotic jet stream flow indeed, folks. Also, this S-shaped region down here over the southern Pacific, meridional jet stream flow at its finest. Here are the jet streams of the eastern world. And we're still seeing chaotic jet streams around places like Australia. And you see this clockwise rotating low pressure system right here. That is a powerful low, although not as powerful as it's been in previous days. Let's check the surface winds real quick. And you can see that is still quite strong there. A quick click is showing us 53 mile per hour winds. 
So nearly hurricane force winds there probably are hurricane force fin force winds. We won't spend any more time on that. Some rough seas in the southern Indian Ocean for sure. Let's talk about cosmic rays since cosmic rays affect climate. We decided to splice it into today's meteorology segment. So let's blast through this as the video is getting kind of long here. We saw a huge uptick here in cosmic ray flux at the Apatite neutron monitor. So check, check this out. The past couple days here, major uptick, making it an uptick for the past 30 days because of this extreme cosmic ray event at the Apatite neutron monitor. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere and you think you've been going crazy the last four days, maybe you were with that increase in cosmic ray flux. Although Barentsburg, also a very far north neutron monitor, not showing so much the same thing at all. This one showing a downtick over the past 30 days and nothing similar at all in the past week. Let's go farther south and see what's going on at Athens. Here's the past 30 days at the Athens Neutron Monitor. And again, cosmic ray flux affects the weather, folks. Cosmic rays cause ionization pathways. Ionization pathways cause cloud nucleation, which affects weather. And I won't go farther into that during this video, but there's 30 days at Athens. Pretty flat over the past 30 days as far as the data that's there. Here's Mexico City. And we do see a similar slope here in the past week at Mexico City, indicating that the Apatite Neutron Monitor is probably not anomalous data. It looked legit. And so you can see that also happening at Mexico City, although Mexico City is still quite flat over the past 30 days. And lastly, we'll go to Oulu, Finland, and two, mon two monitors on Antarctica. So there's Oulu, Oulu, Finland. Here's DOMC Antarctica. By the way, Olu is flat on the past 30 days. Here's DOMC Antarctica. A downtick on DOMC Antarctica over the past 30, but a bit of an uptick there during the past week. DOMC Antarctica, slight downward trend over the past 30, and a similar slope there on the past week. If you know somebody who's lost their mind, maybe they lost their mind as a result of weather from space, as there have been a lot of people acting very crazy in the past couple of days. Leave us a comment if you've noticed somebody who appears to be nuts. Next, we're looking at a real-time lightning map, and we really have seen a lull in lightning on a worldwide scale. I use lightningmaps.org when I hear thunder. It allows me to convince my foes that I'm Thor or perhaps Odin and causing the thunder and not just forecasting it. Here's some more meteorology data. It's the pressure map on windy.com. Here's where pressure is now, and here's where we expect it to be, according to the GFS forecast, at 12 noon tomorrow. A bit of a low pressure system there off the coast of South Carolina may make for some good surf conditions. Leave us a comment if you're a surfer. Next, looking at the cloud layer, over my head, and if you're wondering where we're located, Smash Staff and I are located right about there in Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. So there's the cloud layer over the mid-Atlantic. Here's the water vapor map. And again, there's the cloud layer, and there's the water vapor map. Please don't tell us that those are chemtrails because that's not a thing. And we'll show you the full view here as well of the lower 48. Just bear with me a quick moment here while I get that up. There you go. There is the cloud situation, and there is the water vapor situation. As the atmospheric river has been rerouted by this dry mass of air, and if you're not a meteorology expert, dry air is more massive than moist air due to the molar mass of nitrogen versus H2O. So there's H2O. There are clouds. 
And you can find all this stuff, if you like, at the NASA GOES Interactive Weather Satellites. It's fantastic. Here's a U.S. Doppler radar map. And we see some heavy storms there over Louisiana. No apparent lightning generated yet. And hey, Smash Team, thanks for tuning in. We've got bonus features, but first, we must thank our patrons, the true source of funding for the content. Thanks to our newest patron, you will appear on the credit crawl soon as we update this monthly. And please consider becoming a patron, all of you viewers who are viewing the content for free. Our patrons are the ones who are making it likely that we continue to make this videos, make these videos free and publicly visible. You can become a patron yourself at patreon.com slash smashamash. We need lots more funding to accomplish our goals this year. Patreon.com slash smashamash. And if you enjoy the content, please press like and subscribe on YouTube. Please share the videos on your social media. Tell your friends, your foes, your science noobs, and your science pros about the channel. Thanks again, everybody who tuned in. Here come bonus features. We're going to show you a high-res view of the possible sunspot. And I did see Umbre when I did show prep. Let's see where we are now. Please leave us a comment if you're viewing the video from a spaceship, alternate plane of existence, alternate reality, timeline, solar system. Please leave a comment if you're an extraterrestrial. So we actually don't see any umbrae there. That is ugly. We don't see any umbrae there. That is, that has actually degraded since I did show prep. There is that area in magnetogram. And again, no umbrae. So not a sunspot. It's got potential. Some of that potential has looked like it has evaporated. And again, we see quite low levels of solar activity here. The radio flux all the way down to 71 solar flux units. Here's the rowdiness that sent out that coronal mass ejection. And you'll see this outburst right there. A couple of outbursts, actually, and some prominences associated with them. Here in 304 angstroms from the SDO ionized helium. I'll let that play through once more for your viewing pleasure, stargazers. And since the sun is the Rosetta Stone of cosmology, we're studying it in super depth because of the rewriting of things like astrophysics. I asked you earlier, what evil lurks in the depths of coronal holes? It's not so evil. It's mainly hydrogen nuclei. Also helium nuclei in there, as well as electrons and various heavy elements, including some iron, which is the UV emission spectra that you're looking at now. It's 193 angstroms. And last but not least, by the way, we can expect a coronal hole windstream from that in about three days. And last but not least, here is the 171 angstroms. 24 hour video of our local yellow dwarf Shout out to the sun. Dear the sun, if you have a YouTube channel, leave us a comment. We'll uh, be more than happy to interview you. And if you've got a comment for the sun, leave it in the comment section. Perhaps we'll read it on tomorrow's Daily Space Weather video. In any case, thanks for tuning in, folks. It's about that time. Remember to stare at the sun, and when you're staring at the sun, don't drink, but if you do, don't drive. And since it'll never be now again, welcome to the Neo-Renaissance. May that solar wind be at your back. <laughs>